Good morning once again. Welcome to today's session on the book of Hebrews. Um, so even before we could begin with our se uh, class, can I request Jeffina to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, ma'am. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the amazing class that you're about to have. God, we invite Holy Spirit to lead us as we read through the passages, as we read through the things that are in the chapters and as our ma'am teachers. Help us to listen, help us to understand it, help us to open our hearts and eyes so that we can understand your words, God, so that we can apply that word, so that we can explain these words to others, the living words which save souls. So help us to understand it and do the right things on this life. I pray for everyone who is right here. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for joining together as a class. Let your Holy Spirit guide us. Let us understand every little things and live an amazing life for you down here on this earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jeffina. So what do we know about the book of Hebrews? All that we have heard till date. So let's look at the background of this book. So in the first century AD, the practice of the Judaism was sanctioned and protected by the Roman law. So the Christians were not part of this, um, uh, uh, were, not uh, were not participating or practicing the Roman law anymore. So there was uh, Jewish Christians faced a lot of persecution because of this. And they also risked danger even to death or return to safety uh, with regard to it. So this letter warned Christians, that is the, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, warned Christians against returning in any way to Judaism or encourage them to go on to maturity in Christ. So we see Luther, some of the scholars like Luther, Zwingli and Calvin nailed it to the masthead of their moment in three principles from the book of Hebrew. What is that? First, we talk about there's no sacrifice when you compare it to Calvary. There is no priest or no high priest but Jesus Christ. And there's no confession but the throne of grace. And uh, we also see the date and the location when this letter was written. So the scholars uh, probably say that it was written about 68 AD from Italy. It was probably before the temple's destruction in 70 AD. The temple was apparently still in use. There was a, um, the worship was actually going on in the temple. And if, if there was a destruction of the temple, I'm sure uh, the writer of Hebrew would have made a note in this book. However, it was also uh, not much earlier than 70 because the recipients were apparently the second generation Christian who themselves had been believed for a long time. And we also see Timothy has just been released from prison. When we read through Hebrews chapter 13, verse 23, we see that. Timothy has just been released from prison and his impris imprisonment is not mentioned elsewhere in the scripture but could have followed Paul's plea to visit him in prison. And the key verse of this, can I request one of us to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Anyone who was taken, can we all please read? Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Amen. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. So the whole book carries this title saying that a great high priest. Great high priest is no one else than Jesus Christ. So it is highlighting that Jesus Christ is a great high priest. And this is the theme that we see throughout the book. 
and what was the purpose of this book anyone yes there are many purposes so let's list them for you to show the superiority the betterment of lord jesus christ above everything else and also uh, second point we see that is to warn them concerning their backsliding uh, with regard to the ritualism or any kind of ceremonial practice that was happening around. The third point we see is to encourage them to go with the Lord and grow in grace. And the fourth one is to alert them concerning the dangers of false teaching. So these were some of the uh, some of the purpose or uh, behind the behind the book of Hebrews. And let's see some of the uh, main views concerning the authorship, because there's a lot of debate happening. Who is the author of this book? So yes, uh, as we go through it, some of the scholars say it could be um, Paul, Apostle Paul, or it could be Luke, Dr. Dr. Luke, or it could be Apollos. Some of them say it could also be Barnabas or Aquila or Priscilla. So we are not too sure, but most scholars rely on Apostle Paul. Now, why do they rely on Apostle Paul? Some of the argument goes like this. So let's see why some of them are against the authorship of Paul. So I would like to list them and few points so that it's easy for us to remember. So the first point why they say Paul may not be the author was because Paul's name is not found in the epistle as he addressed in the other 13 epistles. But could also be the reason if Paul were to write this letter to the Hebrew believers and his name in the document might do much harm than good. Why? Because um, he may not be able to reach or the Hebrew believers may not receive if he puts his name in the letter. So um, Paul could have hidden his identity so that the Jews uh, were, uh, you know, because he had faced already a great persecution from the Jewish side because he was trying to take the gospel to the Gentiles and made it very easy for the Gentiles to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior and not been part of any kind of rituals which they follow. So because of that, he had a lot of, um, I mean, he, he had been faced great, this great persecution from the Jewish believer side. And the second point we could also see is this book represents a different style of writing when compared to the other. But if you see, the book was addressed to an entirely different audience. So maybe because uh, of the audience sake, Paul could have naturally written it differently. So the third point we also see is the language in the book is, is of pure Greek language through which it was written. So we also know that uh, uh, Paul had a good educational background. So it could be possible that Paul could have used highest the Greek, uh, Greek usage in this particular book because he is addressing to Hebrews. So Paul, um, fourth point, we could also see that Paul was chosen by God and he was recognized in the early church as the apostle to the Gentiles. So this epistle, never mentions anything about Gentiles. If you see the other letters, we we have seen that Paul mentioning one or two instances about the Gentiles. But in this particular letter, he has not mentioned anything to do with the Gentiles. So one could be the reason because Paul's um, you know, uh, the conflict that was happening between the Jews and the Gentiles. So this could also be the reason that Paul could have avoided mentioning anything to do with the Gentiles in this letter. And he wants to mainly concentrate on the Jews. So in this passage, 
uh, you know, he writes about the children of Israel is mentioned last. And it is likely that this would be one of the last letter of Paul's work. So uh, it could be that. And some of the arguments goes like this, like uh, Paul is the main author of this letter. So why do they uh, uh, why do they argue on that? Paul could have been the letter, would have been the author of this letter. So uh, one of the point, it could be like, there is a typical Paul salutation, which is found in one or two forms in every one of, uh, every one of the 13 epistles of Paul. So in fact, it was also Paul's token, the way he, uh, uh, he greets people. So even in this letter, he greets people uh, somewhere comparative to the letter of Rome's. And the second point we also see here is the author of this book had a Greek background by virtue uh, of his own Greek language. And he also used Jewish background by his understanding of the Jewish religious custom. So Paul had both. And he qualifies in that area. So the some of the scholars say Paul is the author of this letter. And also the third point we see here is when Peter wrote to the Jewish believers, he seemed, he has also indicated that Paul had written to them. So there is no other epistle that we, we could qualify that Okay, but then the letter of Hebrews qualifies because it is uh, it is addressing only to the Hebrew believers. So some of the scholars say uh, because Peter addresses that Paul has written to the Jewish believers. So this could be the letter. And and there's the fourth point they, they share about is the person who wrote this book was a man who was truly trained in the scripture with a tremendous knowledge and revelation on the relationship of the old covenant to the new covenant. So in this, we know that Paul is trained. Paul had the revelation from the Holy Spirit and he was also being a well-trained Pharisee. So with his experience, he could have put this letter together. And we also see that this letter was written by one who had been in bonds. Can I request one of us to please turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, please? Hebrews 10, verse 34. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 34. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted consification of your property because you knew that yourself had better lasting possession. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, you know, um, uh, even uh, in the same verse 18 and 19, same chapter, verse 18 and 19, we see that now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Sorry, sorry, that's not the verse. Okay. Um, 13, chapter 13, verse 18 and 19. For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I specially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. So here we see Paul's imprisonment uh, would have done this for him. And this letter was written from Italy, of which Rome was the capital in those days. So some of the authors say it could be that Paul wrote this letter when he was imprisoned at Rome. The author seems to have been a close associate and traveling companion with Timothy because in uh, chapter 13 verse 23 we see that know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly 
So here we see that, um, you know, the association between the author to Timothy. So one was very closely associated with Timothy. We know that was Apostle Paul. And we also see the next point. Um, Paul always had a tremendous desire to see his brethren saved. So the whole letter we see the way it has been written is uh, to see that people are saved by the grace, by approaching the throne of grace. And we also see that this book was written to the Hebrew Christians. And we can uh, for sure know that the audience were the Jewish Christians. Those were the Hebrew Christians. And uh, yeah, um, so it was written to the saints. When we take up Hebrew chapter 5, when we turn to Hebrew chapter 5, verse 12, we see that for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you against the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So we see that he is writing to the saints of the uh, of uh, of these Hebrew Christians who are who are very new, who are very new in faith. So he's writing to them. And the second point we also see is he's writing to the saints who had suffered great persecution and hardship in the church. Um, and also we see that he is also addressing to the Christian community of a considerable size. Uh, so where he says, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints he addresses in chapter 13, verse 24. And many scholars have suggested that the church at Jerusalem was the original recipient of this letter, which was then circulated to other places. Uh, till now, I hope we are uh, okay, uh, we understood. And then now we can go to why this book was written. We understand the purpose. So this book was written mainly to the Hebrew believers to make a transition. Now to make a transition of what? This book helps us to understand the old covenant to the new covenant. It was mainly written for the Hebrew believers to get weaned from the Jewish customs and their traditions. And here we see in this letter how the author shows the shadow and the real covenant throughout the book. When we read especially chapter 8, 9 and chapter 10, we see how he shows the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. That which was shadow has been fulfilled in the new covenant covenant. Can I request one of us to turn to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 to 14. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 to 14. Days after day, every priest stands, perform his religious duties again and again. He offers same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since the time he waits for his enemies to he made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Sanctified. Amen. Amen. So when Author describes like Christ's death perfects the sacrifice, perfects the sanctify. So here we see the that which was in the old covenant that was there was a continual sacrifice, but in the new covenant there's only once and for all the sacrifice has been made. In the old covenant, the sacrifice that was made was temporary, but in the new covenant it is for eternal. And we also see this letter warns the believers, the apostles. There seem to be some kind of concern in the mind of the author of this book that because of the growing intensity of 
opposition to Christianity and the weakness of the faith of these believers. So, um, you know, he addresses this book to them to strengthen the faith. That's why, um, you know, uh, there is a, a whole chapter, the wall of faith, or the hall of faith, where he's addressing, he's addressing how, how the ancestors lived in faith so that we can be strengthened in our faith and do not give in to any of the false teaching that was increasing in that place. Now, why does some of the authors call this book of Hebrews the book of better things? They have titled this book as the book of better things. In keeping the purpose for which the book of Hebrew was written, we find focus on two words, that is, better and great, often in this letter. Why? Because Christ is presented as a preeminent one and the one who established a new and a better covenant. So Christ is seen as a greater than, greater than what? Greater than the prophets in the Old Testament or the angels, the visitation of angels that uh, they uh, the, the prophets or the leaders had or greater than Moses, Jesus was greater than Moses. The Hebrew, the author of Hebrew addresses that. He is greater than Joshua. Christ is greater than uh, the first high priest, Aaron. And then he is greater than Abraham. And he is greater than the law. The author also addresses that the new covenant is a better covenant than the old. So in the new covenant is better than uh, new it has a better revelation it has a better hope on which we could stand it has a better priesthood who could enter once and for all in the presence of God and uh, the new covenant is a better covenant that we could claim on and it also says that the new covenant has the promise that we could stand upon. New covenant blood is much more precious, much more uh, 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 powerful that could forgive sins and sanctify us. And the new covenant is better sacrifice that we don't have to sacrifice again. But a new covenant is a better uh, possession that we could stand with because he says that we have the right standing with God and the new covenant is a better place overall. So what are the unique features of this book, Hebrew? Anyone would like to add on anything? Is there anyone that you would like to add or share something? Okay. We'll see. We'll look at the unique features. So the book of Hebrews gives the most complete look at Christ as the great high priest when we studied on the on the theme of this verse hebrews chapter 14 sorry verse 4 ver, chapter 4 verse 14 we studied that seeing that seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus of god let us hold fast our confession so here we see not only in chapter 4 Verse 14, we also see in chapter 2, chapter 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8, most of these scriptures, Jesus is the high priest. He is, he is much merciful and faithful. He is, um, you know, as a high priest, he is focused on our thoughts. And he is sinless and very sympathetic. And he also says that um, Jesus Christ is a high priest and he's an eternal priesthood. And he is an as per the order of the Melchizedek. And he, this, uh, this book also says that 
Jesus Christ, being a high priest, was a forerunner. He is much greater than Abraham. He is much higher than the heavens. Um, Jesus, as an high priest, has no weakness in him. We can be strengthened in him. He also says, Jesus Christ is a high priest who sits at the right hand of the Father. We also see that the author says, Jesus Christ is a high priest who makes continual intercession, who intercedes for each of us. And Jesus as a high priest, he offered himself as a sacrifice and provided the way back to the Father. He has restored our relationship with the Father. And the scholars also say that Jesus, as a high priest, is the author and finisher of our faith. So with that, the book of Hebrew presents us with the uh, greatest definition and example of faith in the chapter of, you know, uh, chapter 11, where we consider it as Hall of Faith. What does this chapter talk about? The very verse, chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And also verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here we see the author is encouraging us to have faith on God. When we have faith, we see things happen. That which did not exist before will exist as though that exists. We need to believe in that kind of faith. And he also encourages in verse 3, have faith of God. Verse 4, he addresses about have faith like Abel. So here we see how the author is relating the Old Testament and bringing in context with the New Testament. And in verse 5, he's, saying, he's asking us to have faith like Enoch, one who walked with God. Have faith like Noah. And in verse 8, he's asking us have faith like Abraham. And later part, we also see he's asking us to have faith like Sarah, who could bring out uh, the promised son, Isaac. And in verse 20, he's asking us to have faith like Isaac. Then we see he's encouraging us to ha uh, have faith like Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And later part, from 29 to 30, we see that the author is asking us to have faith of the children of Israel. The faith of Rahab has also been mentioned in verse 31. The author says, have faith like Gideon, who was so fearful. Have faith like Barak, Samson, who sinned, who uh, he was in a, a very um, bad situation. But then when he had faith, God gave him the victory. Here we also see... Uh, um, uh, the author of this book, Hebrews, asking us to have faith like uh, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the other prophets. And he's also asking us, uh, the author is also asking us to have faith of those who were persecuted uh, till their death, but they never gave up on their faith. So this is what the author is asking us from the book of Hebrews. Like, do you have the faith till the end? So the letter of Hebrew clearly states that the superiority of Jesus above all things, and this is an important message for the Jewish Christians who considered moving back from the Mosaic law because of the persecution. And here we see the author of this book, encouraging those Christians not to give up, not to give up because this is the truth. Jesus is our great high priest and he is um, 
comparing with all the old covenant promises and he's showing them that which was a shadow has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the son of God. So he is writing to the Christians who were in midst of these persecution, not to turn back not to accept any kind of false teaching that was spreading there. So with all this, if we can apply this, if the author is talking to us, if we were in any kind of persecution, maybe some of us are, or some of us maybe just hearing, what would be our response in the face of persecution? through this letter? Will we stand the faith like how the author of this letter is, is encouraging by the faith of heroes from the Old Testament? Can we look at each one's faith and apply it over us? Because the scripture also says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when we hear each one's life story, I'm not going deep into it because we all of us know each one's life story, which has been addressed in chapter 11 of this book. We know each one. They all had faith in God and God never gave up on them. He answered them. He blessed them. Today, the, uh, the author of this book is also asking us in midst of our situation, in midst of our uh, circumstances, no matter what we are facing as a persecution today, can we have the faith on God? Just like how all these people had, the heroes of faith had, can we? With that, I conclude this book of Hebrews and I leave it open for our class to share on the book of Hebrews, your understanding, your learning, or is there anything that you would like to add on to this book? Please feel free to unmute and share your views. Thank you. Anyone, or what was your learning from this book? You can unmute and share your learning. Um, as you mentioned, it gives us a clear understanding about the Old Testament and especially the tabernacle when we, when we read uh, Hebrews 9 and uh, the importance of each instruments in that. and the way um, the writer of the Hebrews compares with what we have right now uh, as the access to the presence of the God, uh, presence of the throne room of God, uh, it kind of helps us understand uh, uh, the importance of it in our practical living. Uh, so I just wanted yes. to add uh, that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thanks, thanks, John. Yes, we can read that verse. Um, John was talking about chapter 9, verse 11 to 14. It talks about, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And in verse 15, he continues to say, for this reason, for this reason, that Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Thank you. 
very very well explained here we are we have a better tabernacle better sacrifice made in jesus christ and jesus christ is the high priest just imagine just picture this we have studied the tabernacle we have seen the tabernacle like the outer court um the inner court and the most holy of holies and you know how fearful it was for the high priest to enter the holy of holies he need to go through a lot of preparation to enter and before that but here we have jesus who was spotless sinless who carried his own blood just picture that he carries his own blood and he goes as a sacrifice and with that it is once and for all there's no need for any other sacrifice to be made and our sins have been forgiven we have been made righteous in christ we have a right standing in christ and we have been seated at the right hand of god through christ jesus what a place what a identity that jesus has restored for each one of us that we could claim upon that we could uh, you know identify ourselves in christ that we have been restored back to father the relationship has been restored back because he is our mediator jesus is the only mediator for man to be restored back to god and this was god's plan from the beginning it was god's plan and which was fulfilled in and through jesus his only begotten son who died for you for each of us thanks john for bringing that point is there anyone would like to add i know there's many things to be covered but because of time i just selected few of the points that we could cover but i would encourage as i encourage throughout all the other episodes i would encourage us each of us to please read the book of hebrews and also we will we will have verse by verse study when we are in our final year okay in the third year we will have verse by verse study on the book of hebrews so you will not miss anything much okay this is just the survey which we are going through each and every book but in your final year you will study in detail so is there anyone would like to add on would like to share anything if not we can bring this session to an end so can i ask uh brother isaac if you can lead us in i mean uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer please yes let us pray father i want to thank you for this session i want to thank you for every session we are going through i want to thank you for your word that has come to establish our faith I want to thank you for everything you are doing especially the lecturers you are giving us want continue to give them wisdom so that they can continue to impact our life I want to thank you for all our colleagues we are attending this lectures under the APC I want to believe father that your word is taking place in our heart and we are consuming your word we we'll continue to follow I want to thank you that you sent your son so that he saved us and now we have become yes. children of the light thank you for everything continue to bless us continue to bless the yes. families of our lecturers this and all of the masses we amen. ask in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ yes. amen 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 Amen. Thank you so much. So, do you all remember where did uh, till where did we do uh, do our mid assessment from the Gospel of Colossians. Matthew to Colossians? To Colossians. Now, can I request? Yeah, Colossians. So now we can we can continue from First Thessalonians. till the revelation we need to write the summary of this book and present it on the same google class work you all can present it so start preparing 
start as we study and complete each and every book i would request you all to please write down the summary your learning your personal learning on each and every book it uh, it need not be exactly as what it is in the notes i want you to write what was your understanding in a few a uh, few lines okay as a summary for each book and submit to us either it can be in a word doc or in a ppt presentation you can present it and upload from uh, uh, you know upload it on the google classroom i will also uh, okay this assignment is only for the online students for the e learning students i know you are uh, given an assessment or a short quiz after each and every book so you all will continue with that and we will also be giving you a final assessment okay that is for the e learning and for the online students start preparing start writing the summary on each and every book and present it okay with that we will end this session thank you so much god bless you see you all tomorrow with the next book thank you god bless